hi everyone and um, thank you for coming along to my rather clickbaity titled talk today or rather uh, thank you for sitting where you are and indulging me while I talk at you for a while. Um, also first off apologies for the weird level of light in the room I've had to do some creative light management here in Bolton where the sun doesn't shine. Um, okay so let's let's get started then. So first of all I guess I should introduce myself I'm Chris Shepard aka Sheps I'm kind of rapidly accelerating towards my mid thirties now. And I've been breaking, fixing, and very occasionally making software um, since I was about 12 years old. And I'm completely agog at the opportunity um, to speak to you all today alongside the likes of Mansi and Klaus Yadina, um, Andre and Mario, and all the other incredible people here at XConf Online, um, the conference which in future years will be referred to as the conference where everyone had weirdly, suspiciously big hair and most of the participants could turn up in their pyjamas, uh, something which I think will be a great tradition to continue. Um, I'm also a little terrified, so please excuse any strange fumbles or word salad that might come out of my mouth as we get into this. So enough stalling for time. In this session, I'm going to talk to you lovely folks a little about software testing. So uh, this being a tech conference, this should be a subject which is close to many, if not all, all of our hearts. Um, and to clarify here, I'm talking about the tests that people write uh, rather than the testing and verification that is often undertaken at that kind of manual level. Over the past 13 years or so in tech, I've seen a large variety of attention and discipline applied to software testing. From not writing any tests at all, uh, completely abandoning them in lieu of just checking manually um, to these beautiful, pristine kind of gold plated uh, software suites, which are geared towards testability from, from the get go and have that robustness in mind. But I don't mean this in any way unkindly. And so there are reasons for these two approaches and they're entirely human. And in truth, the much more common uh, occurrence of software development is that the practical application of software testing kind of um, aligns somewhere between those two distinct poles. So circumstances, culture, uh, time constraints, engineering awareness, they can all contribute towards that testing maturity. So what's the plan, Stan? Um, in this session, I'm gonna speak about those gray areas and we're gonna talk about being human. We're going to explore the blind spots that can cause us harm and talk about uh, one practice that can lead to uh, harm reduction, namely mutation testing. It's a technical talk, um, but hopefully not too technical. There will be some code samples throughout, but hopefully we'll be able to talk about them together. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about common testing strategies or shapes. We're going to cover off a bunch of stuff around different errors and common causes. I'm going to talk about mutation testing and its history. Um, and then I'm going to show you Striker Mutator, which is a mature mutation testing framework for a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, and then I'm going to cover off some other bits and bobs towards the end. But before we get into all of that, I want to tell you all a cautionary tale. So on April 24th, 1990, at 12.33 and 51 seconds, I feel like this intro needs a bit more gravitas than I'm able to speak, but the, the, uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery took off from Launch Complex 39 at Kennedy Space Center, and it carried with it 11.1 .1 tons of scientific measuring equipment, together with a 7.9 foot mirror, an instrumentation capable of observing uh, visible ultraviolet and near infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Nearly 44 years of ideas and research and development were realized at this one moment as the $4.7 billion Hubble telescope um, was slung to its low Earth orbit of 340 miles uh, above this pale blue dot. And this is a photo that was taken by Hubble of the Crab Nebula, which whilst I was reading and researching about this talk, uh, I spotted and just thought it was the most gorgeous thing uh, I've ever seen. Anyway, it was destined to spend the next 50 years observing deep space, and it's helped to determine some incredible discoveries and theories since its launch. The age and expansion of the universe, along with the prevalence of black holes and other discoveries across the solar system. But so what? Like, what's the point of this story that I'm telling you about now? Well, within weeks of the launch of Hubble, it was noticed that the images being sent back to Earth indicated a serious problem with the optical systems on board. Although it was believed to be one of the most precisely machined optical mirrors ever made, smoothed to within about 10 nanometers, it was determined that the 7.9 feet wide mirror had been polished to the wrong shape. 
So the outer perimeter was flat by about 200, no, sorry, 2200 nanometers, uh, which resulted in severe uh, spherical aberrations and distorted images. So these two photos that you can see here are both of the spiral galaxy M100 uh, taken before and after the aberration was fixed. But how does this relate to this talk? So put simply, this boils down to a deficiency in the testing of that mirror. So this guy, a commission headed by General Lou Allen, who was the then director of the Jet Propulsion Lab over in Pasadena, California. Uh, so they discovered that the problem boiled down to an issue in one of the null corrector components that they used to verify uh, the shape of the mirror. So I don't want to go into too much detail on here, and I'm, I'm very aware that this slide seems very complicated, um, but a null corrector is used to derive a sort of contour map of a given object. And in asserting that there are no deviations in that map, you can essentially refer to that test as a null test, as in there is no result if there are no aberrations in the contour. And so during the construction of the telescope, a single pair of these null refracting correctors was used to verify the machining attached, uh, sorry, matched the design specifications. But when it came to the final verification, however, it was a reflecting rather than a refracting corrector that was used to verify the final shape. And it was this reflecting corrector that was actually thought to be more accurate. But it was this final, more attuned and supposedly more accurate corrector that it was itself misconfigured. It was out of permission by just 1.3 millimeters. Because the final grinding of the mirror was keyed to the measurements retrieved from this misconfigured component, the entire mirror then ended up being built very precisely, but very precisely wrong. I realize that last slide might have seen a little bit smug, but for me, this is an example of an over-reliance on one source of testing. So putting all of your space eggs in that great big billion dollar uh, NASA basket, an assumption that you've ticked all of those boxes and you've verified that everything is cooking with gas can eventually lead to costly remediation, upset stakeholders and many unnecessary spacewalks. And this is one of the problems that mutation testing can help us address. And on that note, I'm going to leave this reasonably tortured metaphor alone and we can actually move on to talking about software. So with that in mind, and given that the main topic of this talk is software testing, I'm sure that you'll all be able to tell me what this shape is. That's right, it's a pyramid, pyramid tea bag uh, invented in 1997 by Brooke Bond, the then parent company of PG Tips, the Pyramid Tea Bag has since been lauded uh, for its brewing efficiencies. And I'm clearly not going to talk about tea bags um, for the rest of the session. Obviously, we're here talking about the testing pyramid slash triangle, um, the idea of which has been knocking around for ages since its initial inception and provides guidance for engineering teams in terms of informing them the right amount of tests to be written at which level for different levels of coverage. So starting at the bottom here, unit tests provide a large degree of isolation. And in general, they should run pretty quickly. So by reducing the scope of the system that's under test, and hence the number of variables that are taken into consideration, increased isolation helps to verify an algorithm's correctness without having to worry about or having to consider uh, other integrations and software boundaries. So the middle tier that we have, service tests. These work at a slightly higher level of integration than unit tests, making assertions across dependency boundaries. So put literally, whereas unit tests might assert on the correctness of a single fixture in isolation, a service test might assert that a combination of those individual components behave correctly when used together. So UI and end-to-end -end tests then. These provide a level of testing which mimics that which a user might experience. And I've seen a lot of uh, chatter in the Slack channels today around these kind of end-to-end -end tests and, and what value that they give. So by reproducing user interactions and asserting against the behavior of the app, uh, you can verify the correctness of the software, uh, considering it as a black box. And these tests uh, tend to be quite costly to run as a rule quite time, uh, time consuming, but they tend to provide the greatest level of integration between all the components. The idea here is that you can generally compose your testing ecosystem with fewer of these UI and service tests and more unit tests, because these are the tests that run a lot faster and they tend to provide a greater level of granularity for test coverage than uh, for the other tiers of the pyramid. 
And then finally, we consider the cloud above the peak of the pyramid, essentially covering what the manual verification or the exploratory testing effort um, should generally be when considering the testing period pyramid. The general rule of the testing pyramid is for the brunt of general correctness tests and well-defined regression suites to be executed automatically. And fundamentally, this leaves our human beings free to do more valuable things, to do exploratory testing, to coordinate larger testing strategies across engineering, to work with product owners to understand whether or not we're actually building the right thing. And it's without reducing our QA engineers and our, our developers' burden of toil here, we don't enable them to contribute across the entire value stream. We don't allow them the opportunity to grow. But this isn't the only testing shape that we hear about. It's the testing trophy, which draws uh, explicit attention to using a static type system to catch typos and mismatches between method contracts and interface implementation. And the, the JavaScript community solves this problem with the introduction of TypeScript, which provides a design or compile time veneer, I guess, of types to what was essentially a weakly typed dynamic language initially. Then you have the usual gamut of unit tests, integration, and a kind of light sprinkling of end-to-end -end tests on top. Uh, here the onus is on writing just enough tests, but ensuring that the tests you write are the correct or the right tests. And then there's the testing honeycomb, which um, largely targets microservice ecosystems, as I understand it, and appears to pay much less attention to the so-called implementation details of working code and focuses instead on the wider service boundaries and integrated tests for these kinds of ecosystems. And look, whilst I kind of understand that at a design pattern level or a design ecosystem level, the kind of applications you might be writing here are largely data apps with little or bus little business logic. They might mostly be, um, you know, create, read, update, delete, CRUD apps. I do worry that having your thoughts guided by not having to write unit tests lends itself to a kind of design bias, um, which results in engineering testing blind spots into your code base and finally results in errors. Uh, and then there's finally this smiley uh, little thing, which I'm sure you'll recognize if you're familiar with um, probably one of the most popular emojis of all time. That's right. This is the testing ice cream cone of supreme sadness. Um, in, this, in this testing anti-pattern, the main brunt of testing is composed in manual verification and exploratory testing and clicking things. Not only is this expensive in terms of time and the cognitive load on the poor folks actually executing the testing, but it's prone to human error. And it's errors, really, that this entire talk is about. It's what we see more than anything in software, and they happen irrespective of your flavor of testing shape. Humans are fallible. At a cognitive level, we suffer from so many different biases that I could literally stand here and deliver a talk on that subject alone, but this is okay. Ultimately, we strive to try and build quality in from the beginning. And we do this by building software that can be verified cheaply and automatically. And as I said before, it leaves our human beings to do more valuable things. So in researching this talk, I came across an amusing concept that I thought I'd share with you all, something called the competent programmer hypothesis, which to me, in all honesty, sounds pretty negatively worded. It might as well be called the adequate engineer theory or the shitty dev speculation. I don't know. No disrespect, whatever, to whoever came up with the term and the work. But this hypothesis states that a, compete, a competent programmer tends to write programs which are close to being correct. In other words, the resultant program that's written may be incorrect, but differ from the correct program only by a few relatively simple flaws. Design bias, um, rushed work, lack of collaboration on a particular code base can all give rise to this. But it bears repeating in this case that humans are fallible, but that's okay. So what actually happens when we miss something? What happens when we don't review our tests and verify that we're testing the right thing? What happens when holes appear in our testing strategy? What happens when we forget to watch the watchman? And so we finally arrive at the main subject of this little talk, um, mutation testing, which is a form of fault-based testing. So whereas conventional software taste testing, I keep saying tasting, testing seeks to assert on the correctness of an application that given a set of inputs, a particular program will produce a known set of outputs or conform to a given set of behaviors. Fault-based testing, on the other hand, challenges this approach with a couple of main problems. 
problem one is the Oracle problem. <laughs> I made myself laugh. Um, and so in order to use testing to validate a program, it is necessary to assume the existence of a testing Oracle, which can be used to check the correctness of test output. And this was mentioned in the theoretical and empirical studies of program testing back in 78. But to paraphrase, in order to verify the correctness of your program, you first have to verify it against a known set of inputs and outputs that have not been generated by the app in question. So usually this is um, data, usually this data is provided by a human. But in more complex systems, you may actually find that such an oracle does not exist. In legacy systems, for instance, the oracle might not exist or may, may be undocumented or it might be faulty. In, in data-driven systems or machine learning ecosystems, the specifics of the oracle might be out of reach by the compute that you have available. It might be too complex. It might be out of reach of the tribal or cultural experience of the department. Uh, problem two is the reliable test set problem, which is closely related to the Oracle problem. And it detects that since it's very difficult to generate a test set of all possible test cases and scenarios, it is really hard to settle on a definitive subset of those tests, which is appropriate for your app. Where do you draw the line in terms of test set variation? What constitutes good variation from bad or from surface level testing? There are, of course, frameworks out there that allow generative testing for these kind of test cases, and these can really help to alleviate the problem. But for the instances that the Oracle problem rears its head, these frameworks tend not to be appropriate or to fail in effectiveness due to the complexity of the problem domain. So in a nutshell, um, as a tool to evaluate the efficacy of your reliable test set, mutation testing is invaluable. Um, it was originally introduced as part of a student paper uh, by Richard Lipton out of Carnegie Mellon in 71 in his paper titled In uh, Fault Diagnosis of Computer Programs. So he goes on to describe his idea that by seeding artificial defects in your software and then by rerunning your test against these mutants, the effectiveness of your tests can actually be understood. So these defects are seeded in a scientific way. Uh, we're not looking here to any kind of chaos engineering per se. What we're interested is in the, I guess, the iterative creation of small mutations in the programs. Um, and this leads us to our second hypothesis, the coupling effect hypothesis. So in Andrew J. Offutt's 92 paper, he describes um, this hypothesis whereby the detection of these very small faults in an app can actually lead to exposing faults on a much larger or more complex aspect. And this is referred to as the coupling effect hypothesis. And it's by exploiting this via such techniques as mutation testing, we're able to understand at a much greater level what underlying faults might be affecting our software at a greater level, which is pretty cool, I think. So if you compare this to the broken mirror story at the start of this talk and the testing strategy which used these null correctors, this approach is analogous to introducing new contours on the face of the Hubble telescope and then remeasuring or moving one of these correctors to a slightly different position and then re-verifying re that your tests fail or continue to pass. In the case that your, your tests continue to assert that everything's fine, everything's gravy, then your tests can't be trusted. They are literally false positives in this case. So put simply, uh, mutation testing is a mechanism to evaluate the effectiveness of your existing test suites. By modifying your code in a bunch of subtle ways and then rerunning your existing tests against these mut mutations, you're able to isolate mutants in your tests, which need to be stamped out. If your tests continue to pass despite these mutations haven't been introduced, they are ultimately bad tests. And the aim of mutation testing, therefore, is to destroy those mutants. But what are mutations? Let's take a look at a few simple examples to demonstrate this practice. So here we have the canonical to-do list application. It's super trivial because I wanted it to be something simple that could be grokked from a conference talk perspective, but with enough subtle complexities for me to be able to subvert the algorithm for my own kind of evil purposes. Um, so here we have a DOM class which supports a simple add operation. We have a complementary unit test which describes its functionality in that if you uh, specify the add operation and um, an argument, then it will basically push that argument onto an array. So we can run the test there and we can see that um, all of our tests are passing and our test coverage is 100%. Like this is a really naive and it's an ugly implementation uh, for sure. But again, our test coverage is 100%, which is, which is awesome. 
but we can see uh, any other mutate uh, opportunities sorry for mutation like if we take the the if statement there and just change it into just simply returning true what happens then so here we change the program but our test is still asserting that the code is functionally correct fundamentally we have missed something in our test namely that we've not actually exercised any other aspects of the program it looks like we found a mutant and, and so this is one of the examples of mutations that we can see. Um, but what other kind of mutations are there that, that we can try and ram into our code? So the typical types of mutant that we're interested in generating when performing these mutation tests are those which simulate human error. So whilst the correctness of the app can be adequately covered by TDD and by pair programming, the, the point remains that humans are fallible. They mess up and code slippage does and it can happen. Um, so what we aim to simulate here is that code slippage, something that can be generalized by three main groups. So we have decision mutations. Um, and that last example that I showed there is an example of this. With decision mutations, what we look to do is to model failures in reasoning by engineers about conditions and about decision branches in our code. Once again, these forms of mutations typically represent slippages rather than underlying design errors per se. Going back to our example, we can choose to mutate an if statement in such a way that the program is fundamentally different. But again, in this trivial example, what you think would be covered by unit tests, but you'd be surprised at how frequently these errors aren't identified, you know. Statement mutations. So here, the main aim is to generate a code change, which reflects a developer having introduced an error by either omitting or by duplicating lines of code. These kinds of mutation are generally introduced by copy and paste error. Um, or by the use of a find and replace operation or a regular expression. And so in this simple snippet, we've accidentally copy pasted our call to to-do list.push. And whilst it seems like a pretty basic error, you'll be surprised again at how frequently these kind of accidental line del deletions and um, additions can creep into a code base. And then finally, we have value mutations. So here, the testing effort is to try and simulate errors in reasoning or logic about a particular area of code so as opposed to it being a typo or a code duplication here we're looking for errors which are typified by uh, incorrect initialization values or misunderstanding the bounds of an iteration or a loop in this example we can look to val uh, mutate the value i uh, the initialization of our for loop for instance or adjust the exit condition for the for loop it's these kind of super simple errors that often result in off by one uh, exceptions or runtime exceptions uh, due to undefined array elements being accessed. So these are the kinds of things that I want to chat about during this talk and the main point that I'm trying to make is that despite the confidence that you have in your test coverage and rightly so you know you, you've you've spent time building these tests to start with and your coverage report is telling you that everything's 100% and those numbers surely can't lie Despite all those things, these are the false positives that will ruin your day. This is your misconfigured null corrector. This is that last rushed commit on a Friday afternoon before you go to the pub. This is your 2 a.m. wake up call from pager duty after all of your tests pass and you push everything to prod. This is your blind spot. But how does this relate to the testing pyramid from earlier or the trophy or the ice cream cone or the emoji poo or whatever? The point I'm trying to make is that irrespective of the testing shape that you've arrived at, accidents happen and code slippage will occur. If you're spending a lot of time writing unit tests, it might be that you fall into the trap of the reliable test set problem. If you're choosing instead to focus your efforts writing tests with higher levels of integration, asserting instead on the correctness of your application as a black box, if you choose to eschew unit tests in favor of testing across uh, boundaries, you might well end up creating increasingly complicated testing environments that suffer from the lack of a true oracle. So what mutation testing gives us for all of these testing shapes is a pretty elegant tool which can help to fill in the gaps. Well, despite initially gaining a load of interest after having been introduced back in 71, uh, mutation testing quickly lost that momentum as it was considered at the time to be too expensive. Not only is the computational cost of generating and compiling all of these mutants quite high, but the human impact of understanding and analyzing mutations for equivalencies isn't insubstantial in itself. So we, didn't, we simply didn't have the compute available at the time uh, to make it a viable tool for software development teams. And so I guess this leads us on to the actual, actual practical application of mutation, mutation testing in the modern world. 
Um, things have certainly changed. What was previously unattainable due to the lack of compute can now be installed using your package manager of choice for a whole bunch of different languages. So enter Striker. Um, this is available for JavaScript and friends, for C Sharp and Scala. Um, Striker is a multi-platform mutation testing framework and it includes a CLI, uh, coverage web apps, test runners and reporting tools. Other mutation uh, testing tools I'm sure are available, but for this portion of this talk, this is when I spend a little bit of time talking about, and we're going to pay a visit to a canonical, I like that word, um, striker mutated example. So this is the RoboBar app, um, which I've included a QR code, and there's a, there's a tiny URL for you to take a look at there, but essentially this is a super simple site, and it simulates you ordering drinks at a bar, where all of the bartenders are robots. Beep boop. Um, and it actually has a fair number of unit tests. When it was written, the aim wasn't actually to write these bad tests, but just to focus on code coverage. And it turns out it's really easy to write bad tests or to forget a few important cases. If you remember the Oracle problem from earlier, again, you might want to um, take a photo of the QR code or just make a scribble down that URL. I'm sure I can share it in Slack later if you're interested. Um, and so here's just a small code snippet which demonstrates how to execute the Striker runner against this demo app. Um, so obviously here we're in the JavaScript ecosystem, but similar library wrappers exist for Scala and for C Sharp. So you're going to want to install the Striker CLI globally before you start this example, but that's essentially it. You clone down the repo, install the dependencies, and say, hey, npm run in this case. Um, I'm not going to show you any code examples from the RoboBar app during this presentation, but focus more a little bit on the um, the artifacts that Striker can produce. So here we have a, a lovely HTML report which from, from Striker, which indicates the, the test coverage in the code base. So similar to the, um, the rough ASCII presentations I showed you earlier with the code coverage and a little table, it's a very, very simple example here. But here we can see that the test coverage for this app has reached 100%, which is awesome. And so one of the big things I want to hammer home in this session is that code coverage for me is nothing more than a vanity metric. It might give you an indication of how many tests that you have in your code base. But if you start to rely on this metric alone as an indicator of code health, I think you're sitting on a throne of lies. Um, and that leads me, I guess, to the main artifact that Striker is able to produce for us. And this is the mutation report. So in contrast to the code coverage report that we just took a little look through, here we can actually zoom into some mutation stats. Um, and so let's read this report from right to left. The total number, uh, the total mutants column we see here indicates the number of mutant programs that Striker has produced for us. Every statement, value, and decision mutation that is introduced results in this new program being generated that we subsequently test against. Um, and then next we have the number of total detected and total undetected mutations. Uh, and by detections here, we refer to mutants that have caused the unit tests to fail. Um, by causing the assertions in our tests to fail, mutation testing gives us an understanding of the strength and of the value of our tests. Conversely, undetected mutants are those which are introduced against a particular code file, but they have no net impact on our tests. Our unit tests continue to pass, even though the code has changed in the background. These mutants have survived our tests and we've got to kill them. Um, so and we refer to the proportion of detected mutations as our mutation score. This fraction or percentage gives us a rating for the quality of our tests. If you see the mutation scores on the left-hand side of this table, this is the key to understanding our code quality. The lower the score here, the greater the number of mutations that have gone undetected. Again, mutation tests help development and test engineers to write effective tests and to, um, to locate weaknesses in the reliability of our test sets. In this case, um, our RoboBar component is a great candidate for reviewing because it's coming through with a score of only 33.3%. Similarly, you'll notice the roots.ts on the left-hand side of this table has a score of zero. And this is because there are actually no tests discovered. Um, for the file at all. So out of the nine mutations that we were able to generate, they all survived. So test coverage in and of itself, for me, is a valueless statistic, and it can lead to complacency, ultimately. A mutation score, on the other hand, is a much more effective call to action. In this example, for instance, we know that our RoboBar component has a very low mutation score, and we know this is a problem. We now understand that 
given a competent programmer, mistakes and typos can still happen. And we know that these types of errors will not be halted by our CI CD platform responsible for running those tests and ultimately for promoting our code into prod. And it really is that easy. There's no reason why you can't go back to your office right now. Well, if you can go back to your office, review your existing code pipelines and add in a step to try and generate this mutation. Sorry, this is a really incredibly distracting GIF. Um, this is free information. If ever you're finding yourself dealing with a legacy code base, which you can't make sense of, or if you're struggling to understand why your code is so fragile, get set up with a decent mutation testing framework configured in your CI CD platform. Run some tests in parallel overnight alongside your perf tests and serve those artifacts um, that it generates to a web server maybe, but do make use of it. So one thing I want to kind of hammer home here is that reports without actions are just words. So we've spoken about these two complementary metrics, namely coverage and mutation scores, but we can't stray from the critical point here, which is that the aim of these testing strategies is not just to improve the lines of our engineers. The real point here is to prevent errors from being shipped to prod and impacting the lives of our users. And here enters a third metric I want to talk about, which is residual defect density. This is, or RDD. So this is a quality score which extrapolates the number of software errors across the actual size of the release. And it's super simple. It's a score which indicates the number of defects that have accidentally made their way through to prod. Just divide the defect count, the known defect count, by the total number of lines of code. And what you're aiming for, obviously, is therefore a low score. So, ta-da, with a 2,000 line code extract and 13 node defects, we have 0.065 defects per line of code, or the kind of more Klingon 6.5 k lock. Um, so, say you've got a new unreleased program. You'd like to understand what the potential RDD for your application is, but obviously, with no existing defects in live, this is impossible. If you have the known uh, RDD from your, the rest of your application estate, you can use that to extrapolate what the RDD might be for your new app. So just take your learned RDD and apply this against your mutation score, and that's it. You've estimated um, a residual defect density for an as yet unreleased program, which I think is pretty cool. So here's a quick recap. Okay, code coverage, though a useful indication of places missing some test loving is a vanity metric. Um, mutation scores can complement this metric by helping to isolate blind spots. Residual defect density, or RDD, is a valuable metric for understanding how broken your code might be. And mutation scores applied against existing knowledge of your code can actually help to predict the RDD of an as yet unshipped product. But with all these new data points, it can feel quite easily like you're drowning in data. And how do you deal with this? How do you make these reports valuable without everything just becoming more vanity metrics that pollute your view of the world and actually end up slowing you down? The key is to reflect. And it's just that. So take these new data points into your retros. I guess arrive within your teams at a shared understanding of what code quality and what RDD can mean for your products. What can it mean for the lives of your engineers and your users? Surface stories on your backlogs to go after that mutation debt. Why not? So summing up, and I really do appreciate you talking, <laughs> bearing with me. Some of this has been a little dry in places, but I bet you're all wondering what the key takeaways of this are. So look, there are many different flavors of testing approach, and that's okay. Depending on the ecosystem in which you are working, you'll find yourself working with areas of code that need love and understanding where those blind spots are is crucial. And there are tools available to help you find that out. Humans are fallible. Even the competent programmers fail from earlier, you know, and that's okay too. As Bob Ross tells us, there's no such thing as mistakes, just happy little accidents. Even if you're practicing TDD, bias, dips in concentration, too much context switching or lack of familiarity with a specific code base can all result in slippage that will occur. Everyone has blind spots and don't beat yourself up about them. Don't hold each other to account in passive, aggress pull, passive aggressive pull request messages, you know. Working in software in whichever capacity is a long road. Lean on tools to help identify those blind spots and help each other out. The coupling hypothesis, if you can identify the small errors, you will find the big ones. 
Striker is a fantastic tool which can help you to find those blind spots, but it is just that, it's a tool. It's up to you how to, use, to choose how you utilize that information. A report with no actions is just information, it's just words. Take this as a call to action for understanding your code at a deeper level to help you understand your exposure. Hook your, um, hook your Jenkins file or whatever up to Striker to generate you an overnight report of your mutation score, but use the data to guide your decisions. Use your coverage score for guidance, but nothing more. Understand that it only provides half the picture. Mutation scores should be used to complement that and to help you to truly understand your hotspots and your blind spots. Understand and reflect upon your residual defect density, the RDD, and try to incorporate the view of this metric into your engineering practices. And finally, um, I guess just try to have some fun out there. Stay safe, stay healthy look after each other and try to save each other from going on any more unnecessary spacewalks. Ta! There are a bunch of references here as well that I can signpost uh, over in Slack a bit later if you're interested. I know that um, I think Nico from Strike and Mutator might be around in Slack. And I know that Ruka is as well. Um, so I guess we've got time for questions and I'll speak to you in Slack in a bit. Thanks very much, Chris, for a very entertaining talk. I think I think almost all, it seems like the core contributors of Striker are there on Slack. So if people have uh, questions about that, um, I'm sure they'll get some pretty good answers. Maybe uh, slightly unfairly, the first question I have then, Chris, is what other mutation tools exist uh, <laughs> besides the admittedly excellent Striker? So I guess if we're looking to, we're looking now at different programming languages, right? Um, I've got a few I can think of off the top of my head and I can, I can dump these over in Slack later as well. But for Python, there's MuttPy, I think, which is quite mature. Um, you're looking at the PIT framework for Java. I think C++ has its own called Mutate CPP. And I think there's one, even one for PHP called Infection. So there's quite a few, there's a variety of them out there. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got lots of questions, so folks might need to ask Chris on Slack after if we don't get to them all. Oh, no. Uh, one, <laughs> they're, all, they're all friendly. Um, one question which I thought was a really general one and applied to a lot of techniques we've talked about today is, do you have any tips for getting permission or time from stakeholders to implement this? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> I think ultimately that's quite a telling question, right? Like, I feel as though most of these testing things that we're, tr we're talking about in all of the talks today are about safety. Um, but admittedly, those who are removed from code might understand, might not necessarily understand the potential benefits, right? And so I guess it's a bit of a long game. And one of the things I touched on a little bit there is these artifacts that you can generate from testing reports and whatnot. If you have data points that you can take to your stakeholders or um, senior management and you can have conversations around how long it's taken you in a specific area of code because there are your residual defect density for instance is quite high i guess just lean on those data points because uh, it takes it away from what could be an emotional conversation to something which actually helps to optimize the flow of the teams does that kind of answer the question I think, well, I think i think it does i mean i think it's a it's an enormous question that no <laughs> Could not be answered anything less than a, a, a three-volume series, I'm sure, but that was a good answer. <laughs> uh, someone else is interested about a UI. So uh, can mutation testing help with things like component testing, uh, React testing library, Enzyme, things like that? That's an interesting one as well. So I suppose when I was talking about the testing pyramid earlier, um, the only real element of that we were talking about was end-to-end -end testing, which is more what you'd have with maybe Selenium or Cypress or anything like that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no actual differences here. Specifically for Striker, you can configure it to mutate your TSX or your JSX files as well. And you can report on those mutations um, in exactly the same way. So these statement, decision, and value mutations, you can have applied to your web components too. Um, it's... I guess what I'm trying to say is just because the component might not be a conventional code file in the same way as a utility library in JavaScript might be, doesn't mean that you can't apply the same slippage to, to a code file that might not be picked up. Makes so I sense. guess, yeah, for, the, for those kind of things, it just depends on your flavor of uh, language and framework, I guess. Thank you. Um, David or David asked how much so how big a problem are equivalent mutants in practice? Equivalent mutants? I'm not My sure guess would be, 
that if you make a change, but actually the resulting behavior is either identical or equivalent within the scope of your test. So it would huh. mutate, but wouldn't cause assertions to fail. That's how I read David's question. So yeah, yeah, I kind of get where you're coming from now. Um, let's have a conversation around that on Slack later. But I think from my perspective, those are certainly the most insidious ones <laughs> because you have changed the behavior somewhere, um, but it's not, been, it's not been picked up in that sense. And it might well be that the mutation that's introduced is not actually an algorithmic improvement. Who knows? But yeah, those are the ones that, that slip through the cracks that are dangerous for sure. Um, let me just have a look. Um, how does mutation testing play with mocking and fixtures, et cetera? That's a good question. So I, I suppose, um, at a service level, you might be interested in mocking out dependencies again between different boundaries. So it's not particularly obvious from, from that context, but if we consider that the mocks that you're writing, if you're using Jest, for instance, the, the hardwired mocks that you're creating are, again, they're just code. And so one of the things that you can do with Striker specifically is you can have it go after those mocks that you're creating and by like file parameters and file matches, you can mutate those as well. So I guess, I guess, yeah, you can mutate them in exactly the same way. Um, I guess if, if any of the folks from Strike are on Slack a bit later, they might have a few more details on that one, but. Sure. Um, given the title of your talk, I'm going to assume you like slightly like trolling statements. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, surface <laughs> a great question by Muhammad, which is um, doing test driven development means 100% test coverage by default, question mark. Would you agree with that statement? I think TDD is a practice, and I think that TDD can lead you to a path where you have 100% test coverage, and certainly the number of mutations you'd find if you are using true TDD should fall. But again, I'd, I'd just reiterate the fact that humans are fallible, and it's not necessarily uh, your testing discipline which uh, might result in mutations, but rather the fragile human mind <laughs> making bad decisions um, late in the day or having context switched or those kind of things. Well, makes sense. A graceful answer to a, a, a nicely humorous troll question. Um, maybe time for one more question, I think. Um, Tamas has asked, um, there are mutation types that are built in and you can define your own custom mutations as well, at least in, I think he's talking about a PIT test framework. I assume that's the case in general. Um, how much of the errors are discovered by the built-in mutators versus do you need to spend effort, much effort on custom mutators? So um, look, so my experience uh, with mutation testing frameworks has basically just been in, in JavaScript and striker land. And the kind of mutations that that gives you out of the box, I've found to be extremely, extremely good. Like the, the number of mutations that it's able to actually find. Um, so I suppose it, it largely depends on the framework that you're using. Um, yeah, it largely depends on the framework you're using and the language that you're using as well. It sounds as though PIT has some, um, some good functionality for you to be able to define your own, but for Striker certainly, there's, there's loads of them out of the box. Mm -hmm.